All right, is this thing on? I think it's on. Hey everybody, how's it going? <laughs> We're so excited to be here with you. Let me get the music on too in the background. Please everyone let me know if music's too loud or anything like that. This is the first time we've done a dual stream. So excited to have Alex Redfish here. Alex, how's it going? Hey, what's up? Glad to be here. Man, so we were talking about this because both of us were streaming. Um, I was streaming on the private stream for the new 2D class, and Alex is streaming as well, just to an open audience. And so we were getting really confused because it was like, wait, we're happening at the same time. What should we do? It's like, oh, let's stream together. <laughs> that could be fun. That's the only solution. <laughs> so we're going to try this out. We'll see if you guys like it. We'll see if it goes well. Uh, might try it again sometime, but for the most part, we just like animating, so why not do it together? So I've got my screen up, Alex has his screen up, and we're just going to answer your questions, playing around. Um, I'm working in Adobe Animate today. Alex, what are you working in? I'm working in Procreate on an iPad. Nice. Always innovating. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. What do you like about Procreate over Animate? It has better brushes than Animate, so that's, not hard that's to do. yeah, that, that's enough for me, and it's cheap. Also, the timeline the timeline is pretty good. I like the workflow. Yeah. I believe there's a a piece of Discord window on the streaming screen. What is it? Like there's a something on the side to the left. At least I see it on the YouTube. Oh, to the left? Okay. Let's move you over a bit. Oh, I see what you're saying. So many people in the chat. How are you guys doing? I'm so excited. So I've been like nervous and excited at the same time this has been super good is that the right framing on the screen now for you alex that looks good to me now Sorry yes about that. no problems even more real estate we artists like our real estate yeah we kind of have half of the screens so uh you won't see my timeline that well in my ui in the procreate like not everything so we're working with, with what we got. That's right. And for me, I've got some menus off to the sides as well. We're just going to go bare bones into it. So the theme today, I guess we can just start diving right in. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad to hear you're going to be animating with us. Maybe do a combo of what we're both doing. Um, <laughs> some kind of <laughs> mixture. Whoops. I clicked the wrong menu. Sorry about that. Okay. So yeah, maybe just follow along with us. Um, or just sit back and enjoy. I don't know. We what, don't really what know do we, what we're going to do. What are we working on? I've been doing some warm-ups. I think the theme today is magical hit effects. Maybe something that's about the size of like a character's rib cage or so. So I'm thinking... Uh, I did some warm-ups. I'll show you guys the warm-ups I was doing earlier. Something with like sharp shapes and round shapes mixed together might be kind of fun, I thought. Or something like this it has like heart shapes in there. I wasn't sure. I don't know. I want to do something that's kind of a mixture of bubbliness and jaggediness. So I think I like the first one I did best though, where it's just kind of got these spheres that are going to pop off like bubbles, but also be sharp. So looks dope. Reminds me a bit of. Uh... Street Fighter 3 effects, where like they had this hit sparks where a huge animal popcorn like circles fly to the screen. Very yeah. unique and memorable. Yeah. And of course, I like pink. So let's see, I'll go with something like the magenta range. I'm a big advocate for magenta and cyan, they get underrepresented. What are you going for today, Alex? I don't know. <laughs> so 
something, something. Lightning is always kind of easy and fun to do for me. Uh, and I usually start with silhouettes, just black on gray, uh, and see what works. And then we we see what we've got, and maybe we can iterate a bit. Nice. I like it. Now, you may notice um, some similarities between our two works. I've been studying Alex's work for many years, but especially recently as I've been doing lessons for the class. Um, if any of you want future updates, by the way, about the class, you're curious, there's links in the description. Um, but we've been doing the Alex Redfish portion of the class right now. So Alex did some time lapses. When did you do those, Alex? Was that? A long time ago. Almost a year ago now, right? In a no, galaxy years ago. far, far away. Uh, yeah, I think it <laughs> before I came to, to the US. So. About almost two years ago at this point. Yeah, so about two years ago, I hit up Alex and the like, hey, I'm making this class. This was before our first class was even released. And originally, it was going to be a part of that. And I was like, so. I'm thinking we do these little blips and hit effects in different elements. And he did such a great job that we ended up patterning our 3D effects off of those. Those turned out pretty nice. Um, but we never included those in the, in the class. And so it was a lot of fun uh, getting those at the time, but then we kind of sidebarred them for later until we did the 2D class. And now we're actually narrating those. So I've been narrating and studying and like going through the process that he uses. So I'm currently heavily influenced <laughs> by you, Alex. What do you think about my process? Because I guess it's weird to ask, but I I'm not a teacher. And so explaining what I do is not, I guess my, uh, is one of my skills. And I never really like thought about, I guess when you try to explain things, you focus on what you're doing. And I haven't done that. And I'm curious to hear what you think, like what, what's my, my process? How is it any different from like from yours or any other animators you, you work with? Well, I think you have a really sharp focus on shapes. A lot of animators, myself included, um, I'll kind of just feel it out as I go and like kind of try to get the motion working and then maybe go back in and find the shapes. Um, mm -hmm. I notice that you refine your shapes as you go and you get just the shapes you want, just the way you want before doing anything else with them. Go ahead and... Yeah, sounds about right. <laughs> I always thought that it's lack of sketching skills where I want to polish everything right as I go. So I guess it be became my my workflow. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think it works for you, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it works quite well. And what I love is that there's so many different approaches that people can try. Let's see, I don't know if these... Are you starting... Yeah, go ahead. Are you starting by just doing like, a, I guess, the keyframe concept? Yeah, I'm kind of not sure how this is going to be timed. Right now I'm just trying to figure out a shape language. This is like definitely going to be a, more of a concept piece than it's going to be like anything finalized. Um, but yeah, I think this is going to be good. Let's add another little clip there. I think I'm good to start. I'm already making something. I have no idea what this is. So it's like a slash across that then spins out. So. The idea that 
I like to do impacts if if I have the enough time. Yeah. I mean, in the in the game or in gameplay, where I have enough time for the build up to the impact, I like to kind of gather the energy before expanding. So it it's not going outwards right away. So at first I kind of, well, it's anticipation pretty much. This right. looks I thought it'd be cool if these little balls were like gravity. So like they like little planets. And so I'm gonna actually make each one into a group so that they preserve their shape. Big flash, and then we'll suck all this in. A bit of rotation. Jason is asking, do you guys use key keys often, or you all more straight ahead? I'm usually straight ahead, or like I guess a combination of both, but mainly straight ahead. Sometimes I, I like to figure out the final shape of the certain keyframe and animate off of it. Like if I have an explosion, there are so many uh, pieces to the explosion, the build up, the, the explosion itself, the dissipation. So sometimes I do keyframes for certain key moments but usually not from the very start so not like all the keyframes are ready and then i start to animate i usually go straight ahead and then i get to the point okay okay the, the explosion is about to happen let's do like a keyframe pose that i might change in the future but at least i know i have like some guidance where i want to to go. Yeah, I've noticed that from looking at your stuff. It's made me want to be more straight ahead. Um, I know uh, Ryan Woodward often has said, straight ahead gets you some things that keyframe never can. And me being maybe a little more dominant on the left brain side of the artistry, I like to plan out keyframes and I struggle sometimes with um, straight ahead. But I've been inspired lately, for obvious reasons, to try more straight ahead. So bigger flash on the first frame. And then, I don't know how this is gonna look. How's yours looking? It's looking. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Like, usually I don't even play the animation while I'm animating, kind of. Because I, I, like, there's no point in playing like four frames because it's not enough info yet. So we just animate straight, f straight ahead. Uh, for, for some time and then see what works and what doesn't. Usually it doesn't <laughs> from the, like for the for the first time and you have to make some adjustments. Yeah, it's very lucky if it works on the first attempt. I've never had that happen yet. You let me know if it ever happens for you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> there was a time That's where, it. hmm. Oh, I guess you never saw this work. Yeah, uh, there was kind of a moment where I animated something else for you, but uh, that the time frame wasn't allowing me f to continue to keep working with you. But uh, 
like there are some effects that I did for you that you never seen. And there was a flame loop. And usually I go straight ahead for like 16 frames and then try to adjust the animation so it like the loop works. Mm -hmm. And usually it doesn't like, uh, I end up on the frame 16 and it looks nothing like frame one. Mm. And this time, first time in the history probably, it worked perfectly, like no adjustments needed. <laughs> I was so surprised. And I guess I, I need to share it someday. It's I probably have the recording practice. as well. Here's a practice will get you that. Yeah, I want to see that recording. Let's see. So I'm going off the idea that, you know, these positive shapes have pockets of air on the burst. So the burst disappears and then these appear. Let's see how that feels. Ah, it's so symmetrical. This is my zone. I don't know about you, Alex, but like when I'm animating, it's just, oh, there's nothing like it for me. I think it's I mean, like how people feel when they play the piano or any instrument. Yeah, I, I enjoy it too. That's, that's why we do it, right? What do you think about the technical side of the job? Because as a VFX artist in game, in video games, it's not just animated flipbooks. Yeah, um, the technical side was something I was really reluctant to embrace at first, and then had to really push myself to get more into. I feel like this is not I had to push myself a lot to get into it because the job was requiring it of me. Um, my first experience with it was like scripting, actually scripting an af action script with this job I had right out of school. And I was totally eating my words because I'm like, I'm just going to be full 2D all the time, never have to touch code or anything in my life. But I actually ended up really, really enjoying it. Mm. Like those shapes are just not going to work for me. Something like that would be good. Yeah. But then on the 3D side of it, getting into that gradually on the League of Legends engine, that's a pretty artist friendly engine. I mean, it has its quirks for sure, but definitely. That was a good ease into things. And then from there, the Unreal Engine, which is a step up in complexity, was quite a challenge for me, actually. <laughs> but I got it, it now. It's not very artist friendly, in my opinion. No, it's not. I think Unity is probably more artist friendly. I think Unreal is probably more powerful. But that's. That's generally the breakdown. I think that's maybe an oversimplification, but with the right tools built into it, I think Unreal Engine can be very artist friendly. And once you know how to use it, obviously it's a dream because it can do everything, but it's just getting there and learning that that's the tricky part. I think I got the beginnings of shape that I like. It's going to feel really nice. And then I've got them over here for something to show up later. We have 96 people watching. Welcome that's a lot of people. Everyone. Yeah, that's like a large room. It's like a uh, little theater room. How many frames do you usually use in a shoot? I usually try and shoot for. 816 for more things asks Kevin. Uh, for me, it's usually, I guess, 16. It depends on the. What 
like the word, not the size, but like if I if my flipbook is square, then uh, we can I can have 16 frames. So the sprite sheet is very uh, has correct computer numbers. I don't know <laughs> what the proper <laughs> terminology yeah, for, too... for this. Yeah, uh, if I have like a swipe that's more prolonged, like a rectangle shape, right. then I can fit different amount, amount of frames, so I end up with a square sprite shape, shape as well. Uh, yeah, sometimes I, I feel like a rebel and I use like weird amount of frames. I don't know, 13, so it doesn't fit anywhere. Yeah, you can just leave a couple blank. It's not the end of the world. I mean, if that's what your animation needs to be. Let's see here. I'm going to save some of these shapes for later. So I'm going to kind of tone them down and pop them out later on in the animation. So it's got a little antic that you're doing there, and then it's expanding out sideways. Yeah. It's like, I like that. Let's go. Make these shapes much more. Dynamic. Give it some more punch. Even though it is a happy shape, I mean, this is right at the beginning. I want lots of bubbly shapes, but I also want it to feel like it's really cruising. So, I using lasso tool for cutting out pieces. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It probably gets you like cleaner results than eraser. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, here it kind of did a weird thing, but yeah, that's, that's nice the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the thing, thing uh, about animate that it kind of messes up your shapes sometimes. And I, I mean, that's doctor for you, but <laughs> sometimes it, it, it's just too much. Yeah, it really is quite annoying sometimes. Do you feel it, it changed over the years? Like with- I think it got new... worse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they redid their code. On the brush tool, it used to be better. I kind of you had a break. Shapes. Go ahead. Animating flipbooks for like almost a year when I worked on some more uh, realistic effects. And when I came back to animate to check it out, the brushes felt even worse than before, and that's when I decided, okay, I need to finally find some time and find a new app to to animate in. Yeah, I think I do find myself just like making it work, like forcing it to work, but it's not fun doing mm -hmm. that. It's just like, I kind of have to. Yeah, and it's usually hard to switch when you already have work and you already have all your pipeline and workflow figured out. Because it's not just the, I guess, the app itself, like the way you export things. And your whole pipeline gets 
like you have to rethink it when you're switching to to a newer app well i think honestly i'm open to that i don't think that's too big of an issue i think i'm just finishing up the lessons in the class that are done in animate and i know a lot mm -hmm. of people a lot of people have it installed and you know they don't have the cash to get something new or their studio is reluctant to pay more for software that does something very similar and so like i want to support it in the class because it is a very common tool but it has very clear drawbacks very clear downsides and you know if i can choose if, i mean it's not too much comparably for vfx apprentice to buy one license of something else <laughs> um then i can choose what i want to do then i sh i probably like i'm really itching to get into some other software right now animate's been behind for a while unfortunately so it's high time that i switch okay i'm finally happy with my shapes <laughs> just like a popcorn puff but now this is going to allow me to have some shapes slowing way down and rounding out some. And other shapes catching way up. Probably need to read <laughs> the chat at some point. Oh man, yeah. Are you stopping to read the chat? Yeah, I have it open, so I, but there are a lot of messages. Uh, so I'm working in Procreate. I haven't used Harmony. What else? Jason wants you to talk about your Spider-Verse experience. And there's also a good question about how hand-drawn takes way longer. You want to talk about Spider-Verse first? Sure. Uh, I work remotely. I haven't seen any shots from the movie when I while I was working, so kind of was blind and was just creating pretty much assets, like a bunch of explosions. Uh, they gave me like references of what they're looking for and they provide me with, with feedback and that's it <laughs> i made a bunch of flipbooks and was hoping that they will use them uh, what's the word properly because it, it's always kind of scary when you're working remotely and you're just providing flipbooks and you're not the one implementing them. Uh, but so they did a great job. I saw the, the movie for the first time in the movie theater, like like everyone else, and was blown away of how good the movie was, like just the movie itself. It really was amazing. Yeah, I wish I was... Uh, a bit more involved in the making because I think even though I'm really happy with the work I did and the way they treated it in the movie, I think when you're working with a team you can improve certain things and have some ideas that you might not have because, well, you're you you don't see what you what you're working on. Yeah, that's so true. I'm a very collaborative guy, and it's been interesting going off on my own with all this. I mean, working with folks like you though is kind of the highlight of my experience because <laughs> I'm not alone anymore, you know. Um, but it's not quite the same as being in a studio. That was that's something you just can't replace. And I know with COVID, it's crazy because like no one's in a studio now. And so I think it's pretty hard on a lot of people. Some people probably prefer it, but I don't know, yeah, cons. well, like I honestly prefer to work 
remotely. Even though I, there are cool things about working in house. I don't know, I'm just, I think I can focus a bit better uh, when I'm working like <laughs> alone at my, my apartment. Yes. Even on, on streams when I'm technically alone, but with the chat, I'm kind of in this, this state of autopilot where I'm doing something and I can't really analyze analyze it and see all the mistakes. Then after the stream, I look at my animations for like 10 minutes and I see all the things I want to fix. Oh, that's so true. But I can't really just focus on, on analyzing my animation during the streams or I guess in house as well. It's, it's a bit tricky for me. Yeah. That's true. That's a good caveat for everyone. Um, we are not going to do our best work today. <laughs> we'll do what we can, but man, talking while animating and stuff. Okay. So there was a question about, um, hand drawing flipbooks makes, takes much longer than creating real time systems and static cards. Do you find that you're given ample time to create your flipbooks? Um, it is very slow at first, but you do get fast at it. I would say in my experience, um, you kind of know, if you know what you're making, um, it's quick. I'm going kind of slow right now because the stream is a bit distracting, but typically I'd be able to do this effect uh, within just a few hours and have something pretty nice. Now, it's all about the end result though. Like sometimes you don't need, <laughs> sometimes you don't need a flipbook. You can do it just fine without, but in my experience, um, flipbooks are pretty slick and usually impress if you're doing it right. That's why you don't want autopilot on because then it's a waste. You may as well have done it with a computer driving the motion if you're just going to be like a computer yourself. So you need to be creative and that does take time to develop, but once you do, it becomes a lot of fun. Some really interesting stuff. Some people are asking if you can make the, the music a bit. A bit. What's the word? Less Louder? loud? Oh, less loud? <laughs> yeah, sure. I don't know if we should follow this suggestion. Because I don't hear your, your music, so I have no idea. There we go. At least I'm listening know, to my uh, own tunes. Just let me know if that sounds better. That's like super subtle now. Okay. Matthew says, never heard of the term flipbook before. What does it mean? It means frame by frame animation in, I guess it's common in video games industry. I don't know if anyone calls it flipbooks in like movies. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's basically Specifically, a flipbook is a texture sheet that has all of the frames of an animation laid out on it. It's typically a three by three or a four by four. Sometimes it'll be five by five with 25 frames, but 16 frames is probably the most common, like Alex was saying earlier. Um, so yeah, when we say flipbook, what we mean is that final asset that we export to be used in the video game. So 
so I remember where I'm at. It's weird to animate without context. Is the music better now, by the way? I turned it down. You guys let me know. Sorry about your ears, Peter. Hopefully that fixed it for you. Let's see. What do you mean without the, the context? Like no, I guess I no purpose for this animation? Used. Yeah. Yeah. I personally like it. I think before the stream we've been talking and I mentioned that I did a couple of streams where I been just uh, doodling concept effects, not the animations, but just like single frames and shapes. And for me, it's super fun and relaxing. Uh, yeah. So just doing abstract shapes is... It, it, for me, it's fun. It, they tend up to, like without the clear purpose, they tend up to be a bit too similar. Like I, I have my comfort zone, I guess, where I tend to go like with the shape language and the motion. Uh, but as long as it's fun, I think that's all right. Yeah, I'm the same. I just, I think it's um, meditative. Mm -hmm. Just going for it, zoning out. I mean, I'm kind of zoning out right now. So it's all good. Just like, oh, that might look cool if I did it that way, you know? So I did the positive shapes first. Oh yeah. I think they look dope already. I think like, uh, like you're cutting holes in it, which is cool too, but maybe like this is the type of effect where you have a chance to repurpose it. Like if you don't want to, if you want to end up with something different, you can just add shading. So it looks like a volumetric smoke cloud mm -hmm. and like the the shape the the silhouette is already great yeah i really just kind of wanted some sharper shapes as the main body and i'm gonna do those and then i'm gonna add back in the gravity bomb component so these are gonna kind of stall out somewhere in the middle and hang and then the gravity is gonna just like pull it all away and so that's the thought. So I need some kind of cloudy shape to show that there's like form there. And of course the theme is magic. And so I wanted it to feel like magical shapes that are. Oh, I forgot just... the, the magic theme. <laughs> I'm doing, I guess, electricity. I'm not sure. It's all magic. Yeah. It's magic electricity. Yeah, totally. Okay, I made myself a bit less loud. Let me know if you can still hear me all right, because some people are complaining. I can hear you too. Good answers in the chat comments about the flipbook thing. Alex is much louder than Jason. Yeah, I tried to fix this already. I don't know if it helped or not. Let's wait for the response first. I can see... I can also adjust some things on my end too. Mm -hmm. We did a test video. So Alex should be even quieter now, but if that wasn't good. And we're on a delay, so that's the way that the streaming works. Okay, I want to make it a bit more punchy because it's, it's kind of not impactful enough. Oh, that's so nice. Let's see here. 
what if I just increase this <laughs> frame, the scale of it? Kind of works. Yeah, that's slick. I think it's loosely based on electricity. It feels really magical. My brain right now is taken in so many different directions. <laughs> I love the challenge. I love the challenge of a live stream doing this at the same time. If you guys like this, I mean, the energy is great. I love it. It's a lot of fun. It's a fun thing to do in the morning when you're stuck inside. Or in the evening, if, you, if you're if you in a, another part of the world, like me. Oh, yeah, that's right. What time is it there? Uh, almost 9 p.m. Nice. Epic. So that's not too bad. Could be a little bit worse. I'm sure um, anyone anyone here from Asia, because that's like early morning over there, I think, right? In Oceania, like Australia, New Zealand. It's like 2 a.m. or something. So many familiar names in the chat. That's that's kind of cool. Thank you guys for coming today. Yeah, I saw some friends in there. I love how tight the community is of artists and of effects artists. More canvas space. <laughs> when I work, that's usually, I guess, like you're working in, uh, oh, I see you're drawing out of the boundaries as well. So you're, you usually adjust your scale afterwards. I, I also learned that from you. So <laughs> as I was watching your videos, I'm like, wait, he's cheating. He's going outside of the box. Oh, we're artists. It's our job to go outside of the box. Like, of course, you go outside <laughs> of the box. And yes. it was like such an aha moment for me. I was like, why have I been staying inside of the box that I set for mm. myself? No one else told me I had to stay inside of it. Because mm. you can always change it later. Felt like a Sometimes it kind of backfires where like I'm animate something and when I try to fit it in a like proper frame it it ends up being like it only occupies upper right corner of the square but there are like still tiny bits in the left corner so you can't like scale it it's just like very inefficiently spread out and probably mm -hmm. like i mean usually i think it looks good but there's no like super critical reason for it to be that way and probably if I think about the like size restrictions from the very start, it can be a bit more optimized, but I'm historically very bad with optimization, my <laughs> with optimizing my flipbooks. That's why I so I enjoyed working on cinematics and movies so much. Because there you just don't care. Do whatever pretty much. Yeah. I'm the same way. Um, I feel kind of sad if everything I do is always perfectly optimized and the engineers and tech artists never come to me complaining. 
<laughs> like I'm probably not being enough of an artist and being a little too uh, focused on, again, fitting it in that box. It's a different kind of box. It's the optimization box. But mm -hmm. if they're coming to me saying, hey, this is over the line. Can you optimize it now? I can usually find some way to optimize it and it still feels cool. And I'll be fine. But if I'm always, you know, hitting the mark on the first try, that's probably a sign that it could have been a lot cooler and I could have pushed it a lot further. <laughs> Maybe that's a terrible approach and some engineers are cringing on the stream, but I think it's healthy that's, to have balance. That's our job. It's true. Like, I think it's healthy for the push and pull. Yeah. The two different perspectives of what's important and what the game needs. It needs both. It needs to be optimized and it needs good art. And somebody has to advocate for each, in my opinion. This is not behaving like a cloud anymore. It still looks cool. <laughs> yeah, flash, don't crash. Makes me scared. <laughs> the other thing I like about Procreate, or I'm not sure, maybe it's the thing about that I like about iPad. I'm not sure. It just like how quick and responsive the app is. Like, I don't need to press file, save, close the soft software. I just turn it off. And the next time I want to open it up, it's there almost immediately. And the projects load in like half a second. Mm -hmm. And to me, cause sometimes I have a hard time forcing myself to do some art where I want it, but I don't know, I'm just procrastinating kind of removing all the yeah remove all the setup time yeah it usually helps a lot for me to just jump in and start doing something that's cool man that's why i sometimes doodle on like napkins because <laughs> it's already here right next to me and i have a pen and so uh, i would probably i wouldn't at that time want to open my animate and start to draw properly something. But when I have a tiny piece of paper right next to me, sometimes I can uh, doodle some ideas for effects. Let's see how this is working overall. How do you approach animating on like the timing, like ones and twos? Do you fix a lot? I feel like I'm always trying something new. And yeah, like this time around, I'm kind of doing this hybrid mix because I'm going to have to go back in and clean up a lot of this motion. There's a lot in there that I don't like, mm -hmm. but I'm still enjoying the general direction. And so I'm going to go back and retime a few things. I need some of these frames to hold much longer. Do you um, use twos for that? Yeah. Or like do... In the end, it'll be on ones. Is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. In the end, I yeah. don't use twos ever. Because like for me, I think, I guess I tend to, when I animate straight ahead, my, I animate spacing my uh, and I can be a bit better at animating spacing because I tend to rely on adding twos a lot and then like if I need to I in between. Mm -hmm. But usually my spacing when I animating ends up a bit uh, equal, like not not enough easing in and or easing out. So. 
I tend to fix a lot with animating on, on uh, like adding twos. Yeah. Like, I'm saying, I feel like. Or, oh, go ahead. I guess fixing it in, in Unreal, like in the engine with graph. Yeah. Yeah, if you have that option, that's always really nice. Let's see, I'm kind of just in the mode of like wrapping this up. What do you guys mean by ones or twos, beats, frames? Uh, I think it's better for you to, to explain it and to show it because you have the whole timeline on your screen while I only have half of my time timeline on, on the stream present. So I can yeah. really show it. I'm actually just about to that point where I'm going to be retiming. And so um, that's perfect. Like, let's see here. Let me just add these couple shapes and then I'll give you a little demo of that. I don't know. These are pretty rough. I kind of, at this point, am sensing that I've drifted far off of my initial uh, intent, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> um, just having fun with it. It's like, it's very abstract, right brained exercise. It's very open ended. Okay, so. Right now, this is on ones because every single frame there is a new, uh, different animation. If I wanted this on twos, I would select this and I would extend it out until it says times two. And so now these frames are holding much longer. So now if I played it back, See, so that's actually closer to the timing that I want. Wait, how did you do that? How do you... Oh, it's a new feature in Animate. You can highlight frames yeah. and then uh, okay. there's like a yellow mark and you can scale it. They throw us a bone every now and then with a the new tool. <laughs> Not usually. They'll ruin our brush tool, but they'll give us a frame scaling ability. Because I, I, I'm used to just pressing F5 a bunch of times. Yes, that's what you used to have to do. So I'll do these pretty quick and then that. And if I want to edit multiple frames, I want to fit these. Let me make sure that's on center. Oh. Oh, can I even see the center point? Yeah, that looks good. It's still radiating out and fits in the box. So now I'm putting it in the box. I'll play that for a little bit while I look at the questions. All right. Where's that? There it is. <laughs> the limited hand painted flip booking I've done, I've always fixed timing in engine with a graph. Lazy technique or using the tools I have. Who knows? Uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, every tool is a lazy technique. <laughs> I mean, we're not on pencil and paper. You know, if, if it's about not being lazy just to not be lazy, let's go back to pencil and paper. But um, I say you use the tools you got. I think that's absolutely true. I personally think that there are bonuses if you fix the frames well in uh, by hand, like the timings, because it's it's not a, just about the timing. Like each frame is a shape, so like you have a bit more control where you can design your animation with proper shapes and. You have control over which frames are staying on screen longer. And usually for me, if I have a frame that's that stays on screen for a longer time, I try to make it as beautiful <laughs> as I can. And I think like it's anime is doing this a lot. They have a limited time uh, 
frame per second count. So they they tend to focus on these keyframes uh, that stick stay on the screen for like I don't know six frames sometimes or even eight. But they focus a lot of attention on designing these shapes with like cool shapes and uh, so they kind of imprint in your brain a bit better. And I think if you only like make everything somewhat even and then uh, rely on engine a bit too much, it kind of lose a bit of control over what your audience is seeing in the end. Totally agree with that. It's really, I mean, you can look at it in terms of laziness or whatever, but I think the more important thing is what you're talking about, which is, is it going to still give you the artist, the art, the artistry, the artistic control that you need in your work? Like here, I'm totally retiming just one portion of the effect, not the whole effect. You can't do that with a graph in Engine. You can only do that in the flipbook. These I've two... been debating whether, sorry, uh, Travis uh, is asking, I've been debating whether should uh, whether I should shade my shapes after the first color path in Animate or to use After Effects. been looking into dynamic light, lighting and mask techniques. How would you shade yours? How would you shade yours, Jason? Uh, you want to ask me? Oh, I see. <laughs> um... So I wasn't sure if the how would you shade yours is in the question. Um, it was. I, just... I like I like to shade it. I like to shade in inside of animate, like it, as far as like laying in my primary shadow shapes and highlight shapes. Doing that by hand, you're going to be able to be like interpretive with it and create some really interesting looking stuff. So that's harder to do with dynamic lighting. Yeah, same here. Probably not in Animate, though. <laughs> but the, the <laughs> software I'm, I'm using for... I'm kind of... done <laughs> with my uh, silhouette animation. And I'm trying to think of enhancing it in some way. So I guess I'm... Uh, starting some experiments here. Just trying to add things for the sake of it, but maybe it will ruin everything. I feel like I have a decent rough pass. I'm like so uncertain of it. I like where it's going. It needs a lot of love, um, but I think also I can start adding in the circle shapes to it to kind of feel out if that vibe is going to work for me or not. I like it. I like the that you have the in the your dissolve or erosion, there's still like vector to it. That's not just linear. It kind of like swirls. I think it it makes it more easier because uh, you see a lot of effects animations that are like very stiff in terms of the dissolves where it just goes out from the center in a like radial motion mm -hmm. and I think it 
sometimes it works, but sometimes there's room for making it a bit more interesting and adding. To me, in my head, like uh, you know, the animation principles. There's a second secondary movement or something like that, which kind of well means exactly <laughs> how it sounds. The movement that is secondary. So you have your basic shape that's expanding, but then you add on top of it, and you're doing it with your dissolves, where the main shape is expanding but you have the dissolves that are like doing this swirl movement which i think makes the animation 10 times better thanks yeah i i really was trying to make it interesting as i went along i feel like right now what i'm struggling with is the actual shape that it's making not being very appealing and so I'm going to go in now and fix that. Adam is asking, where do you get inspiration to create these shapes? Is it a random process or uh, you emulate some, something in the nature or what exactly? Uh, so like for me, it, it usually starts with, a, with nature, I guess. When I was just starting out, I'm focused a lot on the uh, replicating nature to understand the principles of like physics, mechanics, and motion, everything like that. After some time, I kind of focusing more on just designing shapes, and it's like the core of it is composition. You're just balancing abstract shapes. And it's kind of a tricky thing to explain or to understand. And in my head, it's a bit more, like, it's way more complex than understand the physics. It really so is. sometimes I just do concept sessions where I just uh, actually. Maybe I can show what I'm talking about. Okay, so here. You can kind of see it now on a, my screen. It's just a bunch of different shapes. Like I'm not animating them. These are just abstract shapes. And I think it's fun and also like a cool way to practice. But that's all I can explain about how I design my my shapes personally, and a lot of references as an inspiration. This, I think, is what really sets um, solid effects apart from really slick modern effects. What you're talking about right now, it's what I'm attempting to do. And, and you see, the way I'm doing it, it's not... <laughs> I'm not exactly uh, being very artistic about this. Um, I'm, it's a very technical kind of thing of big, medium, and small mm -hmm. uh, curves and counter curves. You know, I'm coming into this like creating all kinds of these these shape relationships because I wasn't at all happy with how this end frame turned out. It just kind of was a product of the straight ahead motion. So now I'm doing a little bit of keyframe designing and then I'm going to have to move backwards from this and and get these designs and these uh, directions to uh, sort of meld back in with what I did already because a good animation is a blend of strong shape uh, and strong motion so I was liking the motion but the shapes were kind of wobbly and they were kind of uh, rough and everything something I really admire about your work Alex is that <laughs> you are somehow able to do both at the same time. I think that's probably a product of practice, I would imagine. Uh, I'm, like my philosophy is practice isn't, I guess not, I'll phrase it a different way. I, wa I want to say that practice isn't necessary, but I'll word it a bit differently. 
I do practice, but usually it's like I'm doing something. Like a piece of artwork. Right. Uh, and while I'm working on something, that's my time to practice. I I tried a lot to just like, okay, I'm I need to practice my timing. So let's animate like I don't know, uh a ball and just focus on the timing. I don't do that. Like I don't practice for the sake of practicing. Right. Yes. And in my head, it makes a bit more sense to me where I know why I'm doing it. So I have a task. Let's say I'm just starting out and I, I need to make electricity effect. And I, know, I never done this in my life before. And now I have a goal to, to learn how to do it. And during this time, I, that's my practice time. That's where I learn new stuff. But I don't just, okay, I need to broaden my uh, skills. Let's animate lightning, even though I don't need to do this right now. Sure. It's just for practice. I, yeah, I usually don't do that. What yeah, was I the think, question? <laughs> I think absolutely. No, that's true because I look at practice the same way. Practice is just doing the work. Mm -hmm. That's all practice really ever has been for me. Is It's just like, yep, I do the work. And after I've done it, I have done more practice. So to me, they're the same, I think. Practicing and working. That's like yeah. interchangeable. Yeah, I'm consistently fighting against this, this brush. Also, another thing that uh, you mentioned, the balancing the shapes, and it, it can be a bit tricky and technical. What mm -hmm. helped me personally immensely, because I, I struggle with this all the time and like your work workflow right now is very similar to, to mine. Uh, it's for me shifting from animate helped me a lot because I think I think bef because of the workflow with the vector and the, the brush of animate, I tend to zoom in a lot. Mm -hmm. And like, this is where, like what you're doing with your current animation, like I, I always do that same thing in animate where you start like pulling, uh, points in your silhouette. It, but I, I found to myself personally, that kind of animate forces me to work like this. And yeah, to me personally, it's not. Like I lose the whole picture and that's why I kind of oh shifted gosh, that's to such more. That's a good point. I see it right. I see it now. Cause yeah, like in your, in your videos that we have in the class, like that's how you do it. Yeah. You do it and it's like, I, it. I kind of, when, while analyzing found out, I guess came to a conclusion that it, that's not beneficial. And I wanted to use a proper drawing app where like right now on my iPad, I have, it's like, to me, it's very similar to drawing on paper where like you have a certain size of paper and you can't go like, like the only way to zoom in is move closer to your piece of paper. <laughs> but, but that's perfectly fine because like, this is your, this is the way your artwork will be presented. So you don't have to go like zoom in uh, five times and kind of having your picture on screen with a relative size to what it will look in the final product, I think is very beneficial to like, you're able to see the whole picture a bit better and it helps you to 
also like with the scale because sometimes when i work in animate and i'm zoom zooming in a lot my scale of the effect is a bit off like the detail level uh, and I, i'm making a, like a tiny flame burst and it it looks like it's a huge explosion because I added so much, so many details. Right, right. You typically have done a good job in the things I've seen avoiding that, but you're f that's in spite of the tool. <laughs> that's, that's something you had to actively fight against as opposed to just enjoying the creation. You're really blowing my mind with this right now, Alex. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to get out of this. No. Now, <laughs> yesterday, I feel bad for... Uh, Just uninstall Adobe... it in the middle of the stream. <laughs> <laughs> well, for any Adobe uh, reps that are watching, anyone with Adobe that might be watching this, like hopefully they're taking this feedback and realizing, oh, that's why the brush tool matters for our users, right? Like that's why animators have a tough time in the software. I mean, you can only get a specific range of style with the software as it currently stands. Um, otherwise, like you say, it runs into these, these hiccups that... Yeah, it's like not the brush itself, even though it's not very good, but like the, the workflow that it forces you to use ends up being a bit harmful in my opinion. But to be clear, like, I, I don't have a, <laughs> another solution. Like I'm using Procreate, but it's mm -hmm. not very suitable for complex animations uh it it's good for doing like single color animations like like this mm -hmm. when you start adding additional uh like shading or inner shapes it gets way more frustrating to use procreate so right now i'm trying to i'm experimenting with clip paint studio which i'm enjoying so far but uh i only used it twice <laughs> So can't really recommend it just yet. Yeah, I've heard really good things about that. Not just from you, but from some others as well. They really like it. I'm curious about Open Tunes. That's a free option. Uh, Blender Grease Pencil looks interesting, but maybe, I mean, if we're talking about needing more brush support, that might struggle even more from the tutorials I've seen. Mm. Um, you can lay down the, your lines, but every line is a sort of a type of object. Have you tried it yourself? I haven't. Have like, you? Nope. Uh, I'm looking for an app where I can animate on meshes or like where I can do my animations and see the results on meshes right away because that would be like very useful. Like if I'm working on a swipe and it's on a on a curved mesh, sometimes it's it's a bit tricky to build and design your shapes because like I'm and if I'm working on a swipe, it's it's a straight line pretty much in my flipbooks, and then it gets distorted by the mesh, and then it gets curved or whatever. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's I want to create like a very designed shape in the final uh, effect in it, putting your animation on a curved mesh it sometimes it can be a bit unpredictable how it will look like you have one vision in your head then you put it on a mesh and it looks completely different and then you go back into your like animator photoshop animate it animate it like on a straight, as a straight line again, then you re-export it, re-import it into yeah. Unreal, check it out on your mesh. Okay, it looks a bit better, but I need to change this thing. Then you go back at the, uh, to your animation software and so on and so on. So having like an app that allows you to see your effect, see your animation on the mesh right away would be good. And I think maybe Blender can do it. I recently found out that like there are 3D tools in Photoshop, so maybe Photoshop can do that as well, but I, I haven't experimented with it enough. Yeah, Blender can do that, definitely. Um, mm -hmm. Question is, what is the experience of drawing like in the software? And I'm really unsure. Yeah. 
what it's even like. So let's see here. So I'm just gonna now animate backwards. Okay. So I got the shape I like, um, by the way. I should pause here. Probably like come out of my flow moment. Um, but this is gonna look weird now with the rest of the animation. So now I have to go back through my animation and get all the frames to have shapes that align with these shapes. So it will work in a way that I like. All right. I have this ring now, like additional element. Yeah. I think it's, I kind of like it. I think it draws too much attention. Like it, now it's, it's, the ring is the main element and not the, <laughs> maybe that's fine. The, the core itself. And, but it's not, well, it's not main enough then. They are kind of equal. And I think oh. some rebalancing uh, is necessary here. Well, you could just scale down the straight shape and leave the ring. Yeah, here. I could have if it was on a separate, separate layer. <laughs> because oh. uh, Procreate is so... Uh, not Ouch. user friendly with multiple layers. Ouch. I just it just on a single layer. So, ah, oh, it's killing me, man. That sounds sounds like a good time over there. Getting that. <laughs> All right. Now we get to see if this brush can actually do what I need it to. Let's see this frame. Also, like the auto save in Flash is really aggressive by default mm. and I think I poked around at one point and had a hard time finding uh, how, to how to adjust it and so I just have this like very frequent autosave and while it's autosaving of course you can't do anything about it you just can't do any work <laughs> yeah like I, I remember sitting. like there's a certain like if you if autosave cuts you in the middle of something i don't remember what it was exactly but it always crashed for me oh no so like i don't remember what tool it was exactly but it's, it's something like if i'm in the middle of a brush stroke and off the save catches me during this time it it crashes so but it wasn't a brush tool something a bit more a bit less free the uh, frequently used but yes. i was always scared of using this tool because I always make sure okay I need to save now then do the the work with this oh, tool gosh. that sounds terrible oh, I have time yeah animate makes a, a paranoid person out of you I I don't hate animate I it's it allowed me to do so much cool stuff in the past so i really appreciate that it exists it just right now it's not satisfying my needs sounds like you're breaking up with it like a bad relationship that used to be good <laughs> yeah let's see Question, do you always animate at 30 FPS or does it vary somehow? So my current FPS is 24 and <laughs> I'm, I'm not very, mm, I don't stick to one FPS, honestly. Sometimes some, I animate something and it, it turns out to be a bit too slow. So I just increase the FPS slightly and uh, adjust the timing in, in engine so my flip books in in games are usually like half different frame rate to an extent as long as it looks decent it's totally fine too because the game's frame rate is 60 frames per second mm -hmm. and so you have some leeway there Whatever you want to do. 
Jason, I see that you're going beyond 16 frames. Do you usually do that, or is this just for the stream? Um, I'm a fan of the 25 frames, especially if it's a hit effect that's only the size of a character's ribcage. You can get away with 25. So I'm actually leaving a little bit of uh, space for me to do that outro. Although, um, probably the kind of outro that I'm imagining, where it's going to suck in and these gravitational balls are going to do their little thing. In most cases, probably should be done in engine with like the whole scale down and all that, but I just want to have a cool little cool little thing front to back, all in all in 2D. So I'm interested in seeing what I can do with 25 frames. I should probably give that thing a death. I'm gonna yeah, I had one there. Is the stream gonna be going to be saved on the channel, Jason? Yes. Awesome. Yes, it will. We're gonna do these periodically with the Effects Apprentice. We'll have, um, I mean, you know, maybe have Alex back again someday. We'll just have to see about that, but. Also, maybe some other artists as well. Maybe just myself demoing some stuff. And also, Alex, you stream normally on Saturdays as well on your channel, and those are all recorded. Yes, it's it's two times uh, per week actually. It's usually ther Saturdays and Thursdays, the same time as today, which is well different for different time zones, but. In Moscow, I started 8 p.m. and PST is 9 a.m. I think you got it. You, you you'll have to double check it because I may be mistaken. Hmm. Yeah, so those are happening, and then we have the private streams inside of our class as well that are happening. There's a lot of 2D streaming going on. Uh, link to Alex's channel is in the description as well as links to the class if anyone's interested or if your studio is interested. We have quite a few studio folks in there as well. Hey, my Procreate crashed. So oh, no, did you I, save? I won. Yeah, it, it it starts up right away, and everything is here. I guess it it didn't crash; it just froze for for a bit. So it still happens, but I don't know the the auto saving in Procreate. It's like you don't see it, but I think it's very often as well because whenever something mm -hmm. crashes or free this free this i i never actually lose any work usually maybe like a couple brush strokes but right it, it's not noticeable the saving process well, that's good let's see I have to dramatically change this. Okay. That's good to know. I probably can just turn off. Well, the one thing that I want is this. This shape down here. Whoops. I switch back to pink. And then it saved. And then when I, <laughs> I tried switching tools, it didn't. Oh, man. It's killing me. And then I got to sharpen these tips because the brush tool couldn't get me good sharp tips. Yeah, I, I was obsessed with <laughs> making these shapes perfect in Animate. Uh, uh, I, I don't think I do it as much in Procreate for some reason. I don't know, just the the way the app works. It kind of like, I'm not thinking about it as much. It Probably because I'm not looking. shapes. <laughs> well, 
Yeah, for me personally, I think I overdo it a lot of times, especially when the the final effect will be like very small on screen, and you're like you know see it anyway. So you, I just spend a lot of work doing uh, perfecting the shapes for the sake of perfecting them. Like I know that they look good, but no one cares. Right. Oh my gosh, I just feel like I'm going so slow, I'm so rusty. It's funny, doing tutorials of other people's work is very different from actually animating. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're doing great. Hey, thanks, man. Alex Redfish said I'm doing great. That's <laughs> high praise, high praise. Dude, I've been a fan for years. I think I, I remember I saw your animated short movie first. I don't remember the name of it, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, a light. With the, uh, yeah, with the flame boy mm -hmm. and a water girl. And yeah. it, it, it was so amazing. And it's like the first thing I, I saw by you. And uh, I've been following your Vimeo channel for, for years. And... I think like my very first job, art job that I landed, I, I remember studying your videos as a as references. Well, that's awesome, man. So wait, when you saw a light, were you still in school? No, I was. It, it was during my like first art job, so it's it was like. Uh, Nine years ago? What year is it? <laughs> <laughs> what year is it? Because <laughs> yeah, I, I don't like out, remember the proper years. A light came out in 2011. Mm -hmm. Nine years ago. So yeah, somewhere around that time, I probably saw it. And huge inspiration. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that I was mean, a fun I mean, it still team. is. That was a fun team of people. So I animated a shot, the shot where the monster comes up out of the ground. And um, sorry if I'm spoiling this for anyone who hasn't seen it, but, <laughs> um, and then I think I did all the storyboards and then I got a team of sort of um, freshman level students with a couple of sophomores. I was a junior and we went to town. I trained them on the on Animate. That was like my first experience teaching people. I haven't looked back ever since. <laughs> I trained them on Animate because a lot of them were not super familiar with it. A couple of them were. A couple of them had used it before. I guess it was called Flash back then, of course. Um, Good old days. Yeah. And away we went. And I just kind of mostly did direction. I think I animated a couple more shots and did some like uh, key images and things. But most of that was done, the actual animation work was done by other people after I had done just the first couple of things. So that was very satisfying. I, I want to go back and do a sequel. Everyone Ooh, keeps asking awesome. for a sequel. <clears throat> I think it's hard to follow because it's kind of a very self-contained thing. You know, it's not really designed to have a sequel. And so if I do one, I'd have to be pretty creative with it. Um, but, you know, people have made sequels to similar things before. And it works out. Cool. <laughs> what year is it? I can relate. <laughs> Do you, Alex and Jason, always try to stick to super sharp shapes or just some techniques, smuggy or blurred main shapes? If yes, can you share idea when you use these techniques? Yeah. Do you always use sharp shapes, Alex? So I've been experimenting with adding soft shapes to the animation, but like handmade soft shapes, not adding blurs, but actually grabbing a soft brush and adding it to the 
sharp edges. I think it looks cool. It's, it's very difficult to control. And it takes a lot of time. So it's... And the result is appreciated by a certain few amount of people. <laughs> like, people who are not VFX artists, like, they, they don't care, they won't notice it. You might as well use procedural, like, blur effect on top and it won't make any difference. So the value of doing it is questionable, at least the way I'm doing it. And usually it's, like for me, it's the value in it is just, I'm doing something that I think is cool. And a very few people do that, probably for a reason. <laughs> but yeah, that's it for me. Yeah, I'm, I, I switch it up. I like to, I like to do variety. Um, you know, sometimes I'll do square shapes and that's really fun. Uh, I kind of think it makes me a little more jack of all trades, master of none. I think what I want to try and do for my own personal development in the coming years is define more of a style for myself. But honestly, I just get so curious about different different approaches I'm like that looks so cool too and I'll end up just trying that and I'll spend some time with something completely unrelated meanwhile uh, effects animation is not something that stays with you it, you lose it if you don't use it you can get it back but definitely it's not I don't know what am I trying to say Alex we were talking you get about rusty before. Yeah, it's yeah. it's not like riding a bike. I think anything worth doing in life, whether it's a musical instrument or a language or advanced calculus, like it's not like riding a bike, right? These are things that you need to stay sharp on or you lose it. And you can get it back, but you do lose it. I'm trying to get it back right now. <laughs> Well, you're doing great. Oh gosh, how am I gonna solve this change? This is a big change right here. These others were kind of like similar. I think I'm just gonna hit enter on that. And, uh, whoops, enter was the wrong button. I think I'm gonna do this shape. Oh man, I love that so much, Alex. That's looking so good. Thanks. That's the. Uh, that's always the problem with the shapes, right? Where you have, a, you animate it straight ahead, and everything is working great until you end up in a dead end, where your next shape, your next frame doesn't match at all, and mm -hmm. <laughs> you like both frames, but like there are times there that there's no good way out of it yep and you just have to pick one and change the the second one yep oh man why do i love this so much i think i love tedious things you know i love lego Mm. love Lego. It's just so therapeutic and so tedious and so like every little piece and just the way it's so satisfying when it clicks together. Um, it's just Yeah, fantastic. I agree. To me, I recently discovered miniature painting and it's the same thing. Like it's very therapeutic. Therapeutic? Well, mm -hmm. you, you, uh, and I think, to me, I have kind of an explanation in my head. The tinier the pieces are, the more focused you have to be. And when you are, you are focused, you are calm. Mm. So when you're painting miniatures, because it's so small, you just... Oh, that's so cool. ...hyper-focus and, well, 
you you your head rests kind of I and i think it. in the flipbook animation because it's so like precise and you have to focus so much i think it helps your head to kind of relax off all the other world things you have in your head usually i love the insights i'm getting right now this is just so good so focusing on small things is good for relaxing i think like focusing in general on like right. on something hyper focusing and just small things make you focus harder <laughs> right totally agree at least for me Oh man, talking about small things in focus. <laughs> I think, oh yeah, what I want to do with that piece is bridge it to that piece. That's what I'll do with it. Like you said, going back and, oh my gosh, these shapes are so small. What have I done? <laughs> I don't even know what's going on in here. I think I overlapped my shapes. Yeah, that was too small, guys. I, I screwed up there. I'm totally breaking my own advice and being like, Oh yeah, never make your shapes too small because it doesn't matter. No one's going to see them. Sometimes, like painting miniatures, you just can't help yourself. <laughs> I think I'm going to just use the line tool now. The pen tool. I love this. Okay, so this will come in like that. That's what I'll do. And then I'll simplify this down into just the one shape. And animate will help me by simplifying it even more. <laughs> even if I didn't want it to. <laughs> it's like, you just want a very simple curve here. I know. We always had this joke when I was working at Wildworks. There was a, another artist there named Peter and he and I would sit across from each other with our monitors facing away from each other's monitors. But so he and I were looking at each other over the desk mm -hmm. and um, we were both flash animators and we had these signs on paper that said flash is perfect. And every time flash would crash or do something ridiculous, we would hold up the sign over our monitor to the other person <laughs> and just remind them it's not us that's the problem. Or not, it's not Flash that's the problem, it's us. <laughs> that was always a, that's funny. a funny joke that we had. It's also funny how <laughs> this joke holds holds up through, throughout the years. <laughs> that's a sign of a good joke and a perfect software. <laughs> we cannot comprehend the grandeur that is Flash. Like, what's your first introduction to Flash? How, how did you end up like this? Uh, I think my asking. brothers were, like, they were into a lot of multimedia stuff back when, you know, things were kind of getting going and we had a few apps on our computer. And I think they had Macromedia on the computer, if I remember, before it was even Flash, before Adobe bought it. Um, if it wasn't there, like I'd kind of heard about it as like this the coolest thing ever that could do all this, this stuff. Games and cartoons. Yeah. It's like, it does it all. And I don't know. I just kind of fell for it. I got my first job in flash at a company called flash potatoes. And I got my first training in flash by a guy named Ryan Simmons. Uh, cartoonsolutions.com he had a tutorial site back then I later got to meet him because he was actually local I think I heard about him through somebody that else that was local no wait I think I heard about him through Ryan Woodward who was my professor who had worked with Ryan Simmons that's right he's like hey if you want to learn flash this guy's the guy and he had all these like character cutout things and stuff and so then I learned it and then 
another guy who had also learned from Ryan Simmons and Ryan Woodward, who had also gone to the same school, named Wyatt Miles. He had a company called Flash Potatoes. And that was my first job in Flash. Yeah, I like these shapes. These are good shapes. It's amazing what a cleanup pass. So I'll just to illustrate. That's what the shapes were. And that's what they are. I still see some room for improvement, but I'm also thinking about preserving that motion and we don't have forever on the stream. So <laughs> I'm not gonna uh, fuss about it too much. Let's see how that's working. Yeah, that's working. If I just chase this all the way back, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna like what I'm getting. Yeah, that's nice, dude. Beautiful. Mm, Peter's asking, what scale will this end up being on screen? So I think like our original goal was to make something, uh, what was it, like chest scale? Yeah, like a hit effect that would be about like on a rib cage. Yeah, I I totally forgot about this. I was just animating something, so <laughs> <laughs> I might be a bit off, or maybe not, depending on like who the character is. Oh, maybe that's, it's that like was a, not specified. <laughs> yeah, huge character. So technically, everything is according to the it's task like, requirements. Is it Tracer or Reinhardt? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's that's my line of defense. That's hilarious. Oh my gosh, our processes are so different. It's funny as I'm trying to incorporate more of how you work into what I do, I just realize all the time I'm like, we are two different artists, but that's okay. That's the beauty of this because every artist approaches it so differently and now i'm thinking this is really a fun shape and i'm gonna really push that shape close together right here but then it's coming all the way down here and i'm gonna get rid of this little blip up here so instead it's gonna be down here and i'm probably gonna regret putting it there specifically but i can always make that Oops. Um, yeah, let's get this almost all the way out to here. That was nice. How it was quick on this side. Whoa, that's trippy. I gotta kill that. Oh, let's see how this feels. I just bring it in. Okay, so I don't like that. Ooh, that's kind of cool. It was a happy accident. You guys get half thoughts today. Not my full thoughts, just half of them. <laughs> Someone asking is, when viewing people's demo reels, do you think it's best to have the effects in context for what they were created for, or is that too much noise to take away from the effect itself? So I have my own opinion here. I think context helps a lot. Because especially if it's like animation for a character move, without the character animation, it's like there's not a lot left. And the effects on, on their own might look weird, but like because they are intended to be this, uh, they are enhancing the animation. But please don't just uh, capture the team fight out of the MOBA to showcase specific effects because mm -hmm. like have one character on the screen doing 
the skills and showcasing your effects. Because sometimes I see reels that just like captures from like gameplay from the and some games are like crazy intense and you have no no idea where to look at. It also shows that if you were the person who is <laughs> responsible for the VFX for the whole game are not doing a very good job because it's a bit too unclear and unfocused. But sometimes it's just like you have people have reels where they they just capturing the gameplay and in the left corner they have a, a phrase that says like only torch VFX are like what I do. <laughs> and you're just trying to find this torch with facts while the gameplay is happening. It's just, it's not very presentable. Like it's, it's, it doesn't, it's not easy to, <laughs> to look at the effects this way. I like a challenge, but that's not my kind of challenge. <laughs> right. That's the bad kind of challenge. Yeah, I think another thing to note if it's like a, if it's not as high of a quality uh, backdrop for your project like maybe it was a student project and someone else did the environment or maybe you did the environment and you're not an environment artist and you're not very good at environments sometimes that can actually distract for me too like oh hmm. they worked on okay i guess i have to kind of look past that part and kind of forgive it and try to focus on the effects but it is distracting at that point you know um right so be a little mindful about the quality of the backdrop that you're presenting if it's like a well-known high quality game then of course include it um, but if it's if it's not then be deliberate about okay is it actually something that i should show or is it not going to be good yeah yeah it just the effects in general are in games they are a part of gameplay quite often i would say <laughs> and i think showing the timings or your impact with the animation of the character if it's a character skill or if it's a environmental effect like showing it in the game environment, I think, like for me, it helps because this is like the part of your job to make effects for the game, to fit them into the game world and make them work with the character animation, environmental animation. So I think personally, if you're just showcasing them like on a gray backdrop, sometimes it works. Uh, sometimes it doesn't. Like I totally did my demo reel on the gray backdrop, <laughs> but I didn't really had a had an access to the game built at this point. I think. There's a lot of factors for sure. Oftentimes, if it's on a gray backdrop, that instantly tells me that they don't have game experience. Because I'm assuming that they, you know they didn't work on a game, and so they're not mm -hmm. able to show that. So yes, it does make you look more junior level if it's not in a context. And I agree completely. Ideally, you would be able to showcase the context and how it worked together, because you are being evaluated for a project that will be in context, right? So totally agree with that. I'm just saying in some situations, it can be a liability. It's like, it was a student mm -hmm. project. It didn't, the sure. game wasn't really coming together very well. Um, and you're not really proud of what your teammates did. So maybe don't include that or, you know, like, I would say like if you're just grabbing something out of an asset store just so that it's in some context but that's not like what you made it for really it's just you wanted to impress and see be like see it's game ready you know i think sometimes that can hurt you too because the styles might not match and right 
the context but, might not be correct. Hmm. Right. I guess it it can hurt you, but at the same time, if your style doesn't match the game. It's it's hurting you for a reason, right? <laughs> At least like it's like you show showcasing your skills and even I don't know. Maybe I'm just mean. But like Yeah, like you said that if your effects are not really matching the game style that well not showing it will not like will improve your chances of being hired i think it's a bit unfair because <laughs> you're kind of hiding this <laughs> info but, no yeah you're hiding that you don't know how to well i think they're gonna wonder about that they're gonna wonder can this person right. implement it in game and they'll, yeah, I guess they'll it's... want to test you for that yeah like, if you don't show yeah, it in your I portfolio, guess... then they have to test you for it. Yeah, it's the interview job, interviewer job to dig for it. Right. Yeah, probably not showing bad stuff is better than showing everything. <laughs> <laughs> Keep them guessing. Hide your flaws. We, all, we always want to hide our flaws in an application, but also... You want to be honest, but I think, I don't know. I think the honesty is the resume. It's like, this is what I have worked on. And then the honesty is in the portfolio too. It's like, this is what I can do. And there's no need to say, and I also cannot do these thousand things. Right. Cause that's kind of implied if it's not there. I don't think it's necessarily mm -hmm. dishonest. Yeah, you're right. I'm just mean sometimes. Oh man, I was always the nice guy on the interview panel. You didn't want me to be the only one making the decision because I would have just hired everyone. I was always so think nice. I'm the, you can ask my think colleagues I'm the at opposite. Riot. Yeah. <laughs> well, they would always balance me with somebody that like was really critical. I won't name names of who the critical people were, but you know who you are. And it's funny because we were such good friends and we totally respected each other's work. Mm -hmm. But we pretty consistently disagreed on candidates. Um, I'd be like, they have so much potential. And they're like, we don't want potential. We want someone who can who could work. And I'm like, oh, well, if that's what you want, then yeah, I guess you shouldn't hire them. <laughs> I, every now and then, though, um, every now and then, though, I got somebody that I wanted. <laughs> so excited. But yes, I am too nice. I think that's why I'm probably better at teaching is because I see potential in students and I'm like, you can do it. I believe in you. You have a long way to go. Yes, maybe, but you can do it. I believe in you. Yeah, I, I really feel that way. I always feel bad because sometimes I can be a bit too critical, but I'm just, I'm new to this interviewing thing myself. I, I I think I tend to just approach it as as an artist viewing works online. Like as a VFX artist, I'm scrolling through I know Twitter feed and I see an effect and I'm liking it or I don't like it. Mm -hmm. And but when you're hiring it it's not just that. And also like you're hiring for different positions and it's it's a bit new to me and <laughs> because sometimes i i feel bad after the interview well i'm nice during the interview <laughs> i feel bad when, when i start to talk to other team members kind of well, yeah, on how the interview went and that's i think what was so nice about working with those artists was eventually it it rounded me out because eventually I got to the point where I was like, yeah, you know what? You're right. That is going to take a lot of work to get them trained, to get them to understand these things that they don't currently understand. And so, you know, that's a good point. 
and I would actually end up agreeing with them a lot on stuff like that more than I did at, at the beginning and so I became a little more critical Well, maybe I'll leave those pink. That actually looks good together. Okay. How does it look? Gosh, it's such a risk that it would have looked terrible. Something's... It doesn't look too bad. Why are these... <laughs> Uh, I keep swapping my colors. It's funny. Okay. Mine is just black. <laughs> Pete confirms Jason is always the nicest guy in the room. It's true. The best I can do is be self-aware. I think. Just be yourself and understand that you need someone to balance out the niceness. Yeah, that's slick, dude. Thank you. I think the ring kind of looks generic a bit. Maybe it's alright. I have a tendency to... Like, I like to make something that doesn't look generic, and sometimes you need generic things. I think that's where I'm kind of the weakest when it... it uh, like, in game production, where you need just a simple effect. I don't know, like something just glowing would be enough. And I'm always like, no, I need to make it something unique and uh, unexpected. And I end up wasting a lot of time where it's really not needed. Sometimes you mm -hmm. just need to make simple generic stuff. Yeah, because it's it's very familiar. It it reads well by by players, and reinventing the wheel isn't always necessary. Totally agree with that. Okay, I think I'm gonna get it back into rough mode now. I'm going to start animating on twos. I think I think better on twos. I end up making it a little too quick, oftentimes. Mm -hmm. So I want this to resolve. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I think I need one more A juicy frame right at the apex. That's a weird motion happening right there. Yeah, that's weird. Can't have that. This tip needs to be down. It's getting away from me. There we go, that's better. Can we complain a bit more about Adobe products? Uh, sure. Uh, Adobe, How not come? a sponsor. Clearly not a sponsor. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry if you were planning to to work with them closely. I'm probably ruining your chances. Well, maybe they uh, want to. Maybe they like feedback. Who knows? I just try to be honest because, man, I'm not going to go and promote something that I don't believe in. But go yeah, ahead. Uh, bucket tool. The bucket tool in Photoshop. How, how comes it they can't make it work properly? 
because because of the anti alice l that's a hard word for me to say yeah anti aliasing i know what you're saying it's like when whenever you draw a circle and you want to use a bucket tool you always end up with a tiny semi-transparent outline yeah. i know exactly what you're talking about and there's no easy way of fixing it like you have to you can like uh, program actions to reduce the amount of clicks needed but still more than one and it's one like mo <laughs> one more than it should be yep what i love in procreate immediately when i just start using it is the way the bucket tool works it just works right away here you go it's filled and i'm so used to animate workflow and i kind of need this bucket tool to behave the same way as animate mm. so that's kind of a, another benefit of procreate for me personally and i'm just i was trying researching how to make it work in photoshop because there got to be a way of like using some settings or something because it's pretty much useless you only use it to fill out the selections but not in drawing right yeah and if anyone is aware of the way to to fix it just let me know because yeah. i might not be aware i always thought it was just me and that i was just too lazy to learn how to actually do it the right way but I know exactly what you're talking about, and it is frustrating. <laughs> and I don't know, I don't know, work around. Because yeah, it's the worst. I'm going in yeah, the addition of these frames. Sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm cleaning up a lot. What's, what are you doing? I want to see what you're doing. I added this weird chunky <laughs> frame here. Mm -hmm. before i guess i have this kind of long anticipation where it builds up for one two three four frames and then it used to go to this frame kind of exploding and i wanted to build up a bit more so i added this weird looking frame i'll clean out clean it up a bit but i think the silhouette works enough and in my opinion kind of make it a bit more explosive mm. and uh yeah I like that it's like whoop. there's a little yeah boom. it's like it has a bit of tension before the final explosion mm -hmm. <laughs> yori lua says spam the bucket tool until it's gone <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it just end up ends up being like pixelated. <laughs> yeah, it looks so bad when you do that. Macro magic wand, magic wand expand selection to three pixels. Yeah, I mean that's what I've been doing. You can make it like an action, so you can uh, set a hotkey to do this, but it's still like it's unnecessary clicks, right? It's not just one click. And even if it's two clicks, it's twice as much clicks. Yep. How long have Clip we been Paint going? Studio can do this in the back in the bucket tool settings. It has yeah. a setting to expand the selection, like automatically built in into the bucket tool, which is perfect. Do you have any favorite 2D effects artists that may be more unknown? I'm super bad with names. I'm following people on Twitter and I'm adding uh, images or like GIFs, GIFs to library on Pinterest. I don't really remember the artist's name that well. 
So I don't know if you can look at people's likes on Twitter, but if you can do this, just I would suggest looking through my uh, likes on, on Twitter and see what I'm saving. I'm not, I don't know if like there are a lot of unknown artists because uh, maybe they're super popular. I would say um, you meet people at the studio who don't promote themselves very much. And it's always, those are like my favorite people because they do it just because they love to do it. And I think nowadays it's very popular to like promote yourself. It helps you with jobs. It helps you with like everything, but it's refreshing to meet artists that are just so incredibly good, but then they have like no work posted online. Um, yeah. They, they get recognized in the studio typically um, for their work. But one of those artists for me was uh, David Shevlin. And now we have him, he's got, he's actually created a lot of the content for the class. But at the time, you know, he wasn't super well known online, but his skills and abilities to create awesome effects and just do every aspect of the effect. The guy was just insane. Um, he still is. And now, you know, he's got his work up on art station and stuff for Valorant, but super down to earth guy, really fun to work with. Um, just maybe one of the absolute most talented effects artists I've ever met. It's funny because I was talking with Michelle Gagné once. Well, this was a while ago. And I hope Michelle doesn't mind me sharing the story. Um, but I was like, yeah, so, you know, I was getting out of school at the time, you know, and I had driven up to go see his, he was doing like some improv effects show in Vancouver. It was like improv jazz and improv effects. The guy's crazy. I love it. But anyway, he was playing effects on his keyboard. So he'd made all these effects and then bound them to different keys on the keyboard and he was playing, but that's neither here nor there. But I was asking him about, you know, getting my first job in the industry. We were talking about Disney animation and I'm like, yeah, I would love to get in touch with some of those people over there at Disney, you know? And he's like, oh yeah, James Mansfield. You got to talk to James Mansfield. And I'm like, who's that? And he's like, oh, so I'm a hack but James is the real deal. And I was like, what? <laughs> You're a hack? He's like, yeah, I promote myself. People know my name. I'm out there doing my thing. But James, he's doing the work. You know, he won an Annie Award. And like, he's just like super legit effects animator. And like, you still can't really find anything about him online that I know of. Um, maybe nowadays you could, but... Um, and sure enough, when I met James, you know, super chill guy, super amazingly talented. Um, I think he's like an effects consultant or something at Disney. Like he does 2D paint overs of their 3D stuff. But the guy's a legend, but not publicly known. He's just kind of mm -hmm. known with his colleagues. That's cool, yeah. Since I'm... I'm like a contractor. <laughs> My whole con career is pretty much freelancing. So to me, posting online is like that's how I get jobs. Mm -hmm. And it's like I usually just work for a project. Like, so I'm not working at studios for a long time. And I guess when I when I'm done with one project, I post online what I can or create some new stuff on my free time for my portfolio to to get a new project. But yeah, that's kind of like different approaches to work. I think internet age allowed new options. Yeah. I'm sitting on this animation for for feels like eternity. I'm, 
I'm looking for ways to add something else. But maybe I'm overcomplicating it. Maybe I need to color it or something. I think I'm just behind you, man. I'm still figuring out roughly what I want to be doing. How many frames is your animation right now? Uh, 22. So we'll see here how this. I mean, like raw key keyframes. Without twos. I think I could just bring that in. Um, oh, how many frames of... Oh, probably about 12 or 14. Mm, okay, I have 13 frames, so... About the same. I guess my frames are a bit less detailed. <laughs> no. You're just faster. It's okay, Alex. You're really good at your job. We all accept that. Let's see. I'm not intimidated. Am I intimidated? I've actually been super intimidated at the thought of animating next to you. But I think it's good for me. And I like taking on challenges like this. I think I... we're both doing great. How about that? <laughs> Thanks, man. No, it's good. I think for anyone who has comfort zone challenges, um, as a teacher, I try to be a good example. I think it can, uh, the risk of being an educator is you can sometimes come across a bit phony of like, oh yeah, back in my day, you know, but we all know that skills get rusty if you don't practice them. And so it's one thing to talk about what you used to do, but it's another thing to show a fresh piece of work. This was. I think. It, yeah. Go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I, I was going to say this is something that Ryan Woodward exemplified perfectly to us as students. As a faculty member, he was still working on, you know, the Spider Man movies and the, the Iron Man movies and all these things. While he was teaching, he was still doing work to stay sharp. And so I think that's important. I think that's something that I, I learned from him. And I'm like, yes, that is the mark of a good teacher if they actually stay sharp. And I remember there were gesture drawing sessions because he taught figure drawing. Um, there were gesture drawing sessions where he's like, I'm so rusty. It's so bad. And the rest of us were like, uh, looks good to me. <laughs> it's, but it wasn't his best work and he knew it. And, and he was there failing in front of us his students who looked up to him and he put himself out there you know like even though it was risky that we might think oh maybe he's not that great or whatever um he was still willing to go and put himself out which i think is really something i've tried to emulate i you know with things like live streaming it's like I don't know if this will be my best animation ever. I've probably done better before, but it's fun to watch. It's fun to talk and hopefully it's valuable for people, you know? I think also teaching, like it's a diff, it's another skill on its own and not necessarily people who are good at crafts are good teachers. So, I think like even if you're a bit rusty, you're still good at teaching and that's what like matters to your students because like they're not hiring you for a project to do a job. Mm -hmm. I mean they, they are they want you to te teach them and I think uh, it requires like a certain different package of knowledge as well totally agree i think it's ideal to have both i mean those are the best teachers the ones who both are good at conveying the knowledge but also know what they're talking about like they can actually deliver on what they're talking about you know i think well this also kind of goes to like marketing like 
can you market yourself as a good teacher when your skills are not like are you actually going to get students excited to take your class when your personal skills maybe need some work and that's kind of like the balancing act right is like I need viable skills otherwise like why would people listen to me but then also teaching happens at the studio level so let's say you want to be you know you like teaching and you want to do that more on the job because you're you've been doing it for a while and you want to progress but then there's like younger artists that are coming in hot <laughs> from school and they're really good and it's kind of intimidating because you're like why am i teaching them because they're so good and i think that's where like teaching the holistic knowledge of being a good developer you know uh, taking good direction artistically but also um, with the soft skills and stuff and so people can find their way as a teacher in that way too we're just getting this to move a little faster, and I think honestly it could end like a whole frame sooner. There we go. Snapping that in with the gravity. Now these shapes too, I'm imagining at this point, they they may not end up this crisp in the final version. Like they might be kind of gradiented or sort of like uh softly rendered or that kind of thing but right now i'm just concerned about getting this motion of like you know the gravity the gravity vibe i like how it i don't know the word like moves inwards in the end i think that's cool yeah that's good because that's what i was going for a nice inward motion. I think like speaking, if we're speaking of game development, like adding this new extra motions can communicate gameplay a lot of times where like this looks to me like the energy is going back to the target. So like if it's like a positive impact, like a buff or something, I think like you can use this type of movement to communicate gameplay. And it's 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 kind of cool to think about it. And I think uh, people quite often are missing out on communicating gameplay with I guess just like abstract movement, like you have this, you can add the motion that's going inwards to the character. So instead of using like UI icon, this mm -hmm. can also be an indicator. Absolutely. In, in some situations, like UI elements are always necessary. Well, not always, but usually they are necessary. But it's cool to think about the, I guess, the purpose of the effect in terms of gameplay. Like, what are you making? And you're not just making pretty pictures. It Like, it has a purpose, this effect. Right. So, like, a lot of games, like, use vertical motion. If something is going down, that's its kind of negative. If something is going up, it's kind of a buff. And... I think it's cool when uh, the effects artists think about these things and keep them consistent across the project. Because the, the player, they don't, they shouldn't be necessarily understanding it logically, but they kind of feel it as long as it's consistent. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, a perfect way of communicating information without saying it with words. You kind of subconsciously start picking it up. Right. So now I'm doing some very procedurally type 
animation. This could be done with particles, but also it's kind of a mix because I don't know. I, I want I want this to feel all integrated with it, so I'm ha I have full control over all of these spheres, and I have like an idea of how I want them to grow, and then kind of like slide around. And then I might even end up integrating them more by eliminating the, the perfect circle shape. I don't know. Like I'm going to just see how they feel as perfect circles. And then I might even break those apart into like half circles or, or whatever else. But for now I'm just going for it. So the timing on this will be delayed. Kind of How do you deal with blurred shapes and get good alpha channels? Oh, that's that's not a question for me. <laughs> I'm I don't know. Like I personally, I usually have a separate channel for alpha. At least the 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 way I'm working right now, I have a like let's say red channel for grayscale with inner shapes and I have blue channel for completely white uh, like very binary channel for alphas and I don't know if that's a hack but I, I'm very bad with 3D engines and that's the way I'm doing it gosh there's so many different ways to deal with this um it's a good question. I feel like I tried something a little different every time. <laughs> I don't really have a super consistent way. Sometimes I'll go into, if it's going to be a flip book and it has blurred shapes, then you kind of have to do gradients in here. And we cover that. I mean, Alex covers that a lot in the videos that he does in the class, but like, you know where you're using the gradient tool but then this is like these are mask layers uh, that's it that tends to work really well just a simple glow around the outside edge can can work nicely too let's see some of these shapes are getting bigger some of them are getting smaller Let's have this one get really big now. Yeah, I kind of stopped adding glows in in the flipbooks in Unreal, and I'm relying on in-game uh, in engine tools to add glows, or like add a separate particle to add glows. Yeah, glows you don't want to do. Um, yeah, glows you definitely don't want to do in the particle. What am I saying? In the flipbook? You usually don't want to do it in the flipbook unless you need something like in Breath of the Wild where they have their glows alpha blended and then in Unreal you just can't do that. It's like always additive. And so... You just have to figure out what you need it to look like. Is it going to be glowing in daytime? Is it going to be glowing in nighttime? And that's going to be very shader specific. I should have made these symbols instead of groups. Whoopsie. I hear a lot of people saying psychology is playing a huge role in effects and some of the major artists have a degree on it. What do you people think? I don't have a degree on psychology. Personally, what about you? Mm. I found a lot of similarities, sorry, uh, with the 
abstract art where certain shapes like you react to them differently uh maybe if i had a degree in psychology i would understand it would have understood it a bit better uh, but sometimes i'm just subconsciously thinking okay i need this to be more aggressive so you kind of have certain shapes in your head that you use to i don't know like improve aggressiveness Yeah, I think we have a lot in common with game designers, and we always work very closely with game design, which is a lot of psychology. I mean, you're essentially trying to get the reward centers of the brain to go off when you create a good effect, you know? And so... So now these are coming back in before the rest of the effect starts moving it back in. And they're going to shrink down. After they hit a certain size, I won't scale them down anymore. So this guy's probably good. I feel like I removed the frame <laughs> at some point. Maybe I'm wrong. Somehow the animation looks different now. That sometimes happens to me where uh, I accidentally press delete somewhere and I don't notice it for like an hour. Hmm. Yeah, that can happen. Oh dear, what did I do wrong that time? I pasted to there we go okay copy this come on animate keep up with me this is effects animation folks Moving a bunch <laughs> of circles around. It's probably going to look terrible, but I'll, I'll learn a lot and then I'll be able to uh, adjust each one individually once there's something there. That's the thing. Sometimes I'm just like, just get something in, you know, because you never know if it's going to work or not. Like Alex said, until you just have something to evaluate. Oh gosh, I missed the center point even. So they're not even going to track towards the center. It's embarrassing. There you go. I'll just say this is the final frame because I'm anxious to see. Maybe just one more. Oops. There's something there that I can use. It's not what I want it to be yet. Like there's not enough Looks variety. Dope. I like the the design of it. Looks unique. Yeah, and I feel like it could be snappier too. Like it's not 
quite doing it for me. How are you doing over on yours? I'm just... Like, honestly, at this point, I would usually move to a different app than Procreate for adding glows and like color gradients and stuff. Because basically adding yeah. additional layers is not very good in, uh, in Procreate. And I'm kind of stuck on this final flicker thing. I know it just looks a bit off for some reason. And it didn't look off before. <laughs> so I'm wondering if I removed accidentally something. Or maybe I wasn't noticing it. Well, I'm thinking this is probably a good place to stop then. Because I'm thinking similar polish points for mine. Mm -hmm. And maybe we do pick up another stream someday where we finish these. We can just keep them in the back pocket if we ever want to go back. And if, if people want to see it if they want to see these taken to completion because for me i'm thinking refining the motion of these orbs and like you know getting to have a little more organic vibe like maybe some squash and stretch or some other things that make it justified why i put them in there and then getting that to all come together to feel like a nice gravity bomb with like the colors and things on it um so i've got some polish on mine to do it sounds like you want would want to polish yours no guarantees that yeah. we'll do another live stream but i think now is a good time to end this live stream <laughs> we can you want to go through chat and answer some questions because I, I was think just gonna say that we weren't paying enough attention <laughs> i would agree with that assessment let me make sure i save this just so it doesn't i'll leave it playing too Yeah, psychology is a major part of game development in general. Totally agree. Yeah, VFX is so closely tied to all that psychology and like the game design and making it satisfying. It really is like you're the designer's best friend and they are your best friend. You really have to work hand in hand, which I enjoyed a lot in the studio environment, being closely tied to like artists but also to designers it's really fun yeah yeah i think modern games speaking of psychology like sometimes when i'm playing a game it's it's kind of a, a bit too much I mean, I don't know how to say it, because sometimes I feel like, am I, am I really enjoying this game, or am I just like tickling my parts of the brain that <laughs> kind of, I don't know, I guess like certain games, especially games at services, they have a tendency to make you feel good, like by giving you rewards mm. and and things well basically like game design game loop like for you to stay in the game like because you it feels good but to me like in my head sometimes i i'm questioning myself is it like is it actually fun but that's a whole new whole nother topic about games in general not <laughs> the effects right yeah, I'm right there with it. I, I've been hooked on a few different mobile games. Some of them have a core gameplay loop that is satisfying, that, that I'm willing to spend money on it and spend time in it. But if mm -hmm. the core loop is not satisfying and it's just all about the addictive uh, qualities, I turn off that pretty quick. Um, I got a good question on, I think you're talking about mine, that, that maybe the initial uh, explosion could use more frames. Totally agree. I think that is one of the polish points that I need to go in and look at. I've got 25 frames, so there's going to be three more to play with. This is, I would say, about halfway done. Um, I took on something a little complex for myself, so I would expect to spend a few more hours on this before it's going to be done. The polish phase is where it, 
it can either fail or succeed in a very big way. <laughs> so there's a lot left to do on it for sure. So I have a thought on like original impacts and explosions and the frames. I kind of notice it in anime too, that sometimes the way they're doing explosions is like, it's not logical. They, they stick on some frames for a bit longer than it should make sense. So the explosion is not linear. Like it has like a hiccup mm -hmm. in the explosion phase. And to me, it started to make sense where in a lot of my impacts in games, your, your, your eyes, like you're, you're not capturing the explosion frame because it like, it expands so fast from basically nothing. Like there's nothing on the screen and then there's ex explosion and you like, I'm not, my eyes and brain are not fast enough to capture it. Yeah. <clears throat> So I tried, I'm experimenting with staying on the explosions, like our original keyframes a bit longer and then continue the expansion. It's, mm. it doesn't really make sense in terms of like curves, but I think if you're not overdo it, it still looks like correct, but your right. eye have like one or two extra frames of time to kind of understand what just happened. And it might not work in some games because like you have immediate, you have to make it like immediate responsive and it might feel a bit uh, like is like it lagging behind. But I don't know, maybe there is room for in certain games. Yeah, actually just adding one frame, I think improved it. So there you go. <laughs> just that frame is holding <laughs> one frame more. It creates a nicer build up. Uh, I think it looks good. Yeah, I, st I it just I think of the fact because it appears out of nowhere. Like you don't Yeah, yeah there's, like there's you no don't have time play. to uh to see it. Right. So it just gives you a, a bit of time to prepare your, your brain. Okay. This is going to be fast. And I can Pay attention. <laughs> add something in there. Like right now it's starting big and shrinking. Like I could probably add a frame where it gets a little bigger for a moment before it shrinks. Cause it's big, then shrinks and then gone. And then the explosion, it could be big, a little bigger and then shrinks and then it I think that would be nice. Also, I could play around with the uh, the pink balls at the beginning as well, kind of maybe have them spread out um, a little more at the beginning, like start together, clustered, and then grow. There's lots of room to play, I think. Good thoughts. All right. Yeah, mine is definitely a bit more choppy because... Uh... I have a lot of tools and I'm animating on. Mm. Oh, right now it's 16 frames per second. That might be what makes it look weird. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit faster now. It's a bit more fluid. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess my recent inspirations are animes and they have lower frame rates. And I'm trying to emulate it in some ways and focus on the shapes a bit more yeah and but it, it's a bit hard to just understand what's what's the logic behind effects in like anime effects because like the way i used to animate before it's kind of okay i have this particle it flies like following this arc and it shrinks and it makes sense with each frame, you can trace the, the logic here. In anime, sometimes it's just like a series of seemingly random shapes. Yeah. And understanding the logic there, because it definitely exists somewhere, but it's definitely tricky. And uh, I'm working on 
understanding it. It's all about study and emulation. It's funny because people talk a lot about, oh, I don't want to copy. I feel bad copying. You hear this a lot from students where they're like, I feel bad copying another artist. But you look at the Renaissance masters, they all copied each other. <laughs> that was like how they got better. You know, they built on each other's work. That's why the Renaissance was a steady progression was because each student took what their master knew how to do and then added their own perspective to it. I think the best we can do is study the best artwork, the best animation that we admire, see how they did it, see what the shapes are from frame to frame. And as we emulate that, we're going to find little ways to add something a little more to it that the original artist wasn't adding. And I think that's why we see a progression in all kinds of art over time is people take it, they emulate it, and then they jam on it. I like this, uh, this comment. I just do work for six hours and keep slapping the space bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just sometimes that's how I feel too. I'm like, I don't know what I even did. I'm looking at this now and I'm thinking of like, I just want to keep going, honestly, but I think it's good to step back for a little bit and look at what you have. When I come back and look at this later, I know I'm going to notice all kinds of things and I'm going to get ideas, which is the best part where once you've done mm -hmm. something, you can come back to it fresh and be like, oh, I can do this to it. Or, oh, if that shape did that instead, and, oh, that would be amazing with these colors and with that timing and, you know, maybe some gradients and glows on this part. Like, you can really come up with something really fun that it's it's not the same as being art directed. I think these kinds of effects, Alex, you've mentioned this a few times. With abstract shapes, you're not really art directing it. You're sort of discovering it it's more of an intuitive exploration with this specific type of style there's other types of effects that are very much like okay we want this style we want this physics we want this shape design go and you know what you're making but other times i think when you're doing style exploration or exploration on a new type of magic or something you've got to just get more in the flow of creativity and just trying random stuff so yeah i don't know if you agree with that sure i think creating like new types of magic or like new discovering new visual language for for a character or it's like a magical element is is just you have to try some things it's not just okay i need to think about it and then I'll give you an answer right away. Yeah. It's Maybe all... some people do that. I don't know. I like... get nervous when people do that because I worry that they're talking to try and compensate for their lack of ability to do it. <laughs> hmm. If they're talking a lot about it, but they don't have any drawings of it, I'm like, how about you just go make something, man? It's like, come on, like, because it's usually a man that does it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's usually some guy. He just feels like he needs to explain it. Right. And I'm just like, just go quietly sit at your desk for a while. Turn on some music or something. Show me what you got. Like, we can talk about this all day. It sounds nice. It sounds great even. But just go make something. Could you just go make something? And it's funny because sometimes they will and then when they come back this is either a student or a coworker. the thing they make is inevitably different than what they talked about because of course it is like you can't just talk your way through a visual problem you need to solve a visual problem with visuals and so until the visual comes out you don't know exactly what it's going to be uh, that's why i think early sketches are so valuable like just get going get started now figure out what it means once you have something to talk about like you don't have anything to talk about if there's no picture so sorry that was a soapbox yeah <laughs> no it, it, it makes sense so matthew asking is asking 
what your reasoning has blown you away with the effects. Uh, I agree with the recent TMNT. I haven't seen the show itself, but I saw the posts on, on Twitter. It's, uh, I mean, that's the best anime scenes ever, right? <laughs> Even though it's that's not an anime. And it, it's super cool and inspiring. A lot of references are gathered for me. The other one for me is Hilda on Netflix. Yeah, I love that one. It, it has like a very cute stylized animations and I love the way they're doing smoke and dust. It's so like fluffy and cozy and volumetric. Awesome. I uh, I really like Lauren Faust's DC Superhero Girls show. It's also on Netflix. Um, the, first off, it's just a fun show in general. But some of my favorite effects animators, Chris Graff and Dan Elder, worked on that. And those guys are just amazing. And you see the style coming through. It's funny because I saw it first not knowing that they had worked on it. But then going back, I mean, Chris, Chris was... Uh, you know, well established in the industry when I was started and I was always looking at his stuff just in admiration and awe. And the style it's very pose to pose. So the, they'll do this really awesome fluffy explosion, but it has this like it grows really quick, it has this nice pose and then it dissipates. And it's just this great uh vibe that they have in that show. I really like it. I actually like a lot of TV for that reason. A lot of TV animation does great poses of their effects. It's like, mm -hmm. bam, this awesome, amazing shot, and then it like dissipates really quickly. And there's something about that that feels good. I know it's a quick, it's a good way to save on budget because you have like that one frame and it covers the whole screen and then the dissipation frames are pretty quick so it doesn't take as long to do. But I kind of like the outcome of that. It's really cool. Yeah, I agree. I think like that's what, like, what uh, I like in anime too, because they use the same principle and kind of like work around the lower, lower budgets where you you don't have to, you you can't really draw a lot of frames, but you make the best of it. So it yeah. forces you to focus on designing cool shapes, yeah. and. To me, it's way more memorable. Like usually, maybe because I'm an VFX artist, so I have like a skewed perception of, of effects. But uh, to me, it's way more memorable than like fluid animation that's on ones. Like for example, on like older Disney feature movies, like it's it's a lot of work, but uh, so, for example, what's the show about the King Arthur and Quest for Merlin? It's like Sword in the Stone. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> something like that. The Disney one, yeah. And it, yeah, it has like beautiful animations, and the water splashes are so mm -hmm. detailed. Like every droplet is like fully animated, and it it flies up, it goes down in the in 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 the water, and there's like a tiny splash. But it's it has certain appeal, definitely. But like I, I would prefer anime style water splash over it. At least during this time in my life. Maybe my preferences will will change in the future. But to me, designing cool shapes is more appealing than uh, making the animation correct and fluid. Yeah, I mean, I my personal preference is much more modernized as well. I think I have a lot of respect for the classical stuff, like you're saying. Um, but there's just something about the modern vibe that speaks to me. And even like movies like Ponyo, where it's so round, everything is round it's very different from that sharp shape that we 
are kind of referring to with anime and these TV shows. Like mm -hmm. the Ninja Turtles show is like the sharpest style ever. <laughs> it's like all triangles <laughs> and points everywhere. But like Ponyo is like all round and it adds a certain charm and safety to it, you know? Like everything feels mm -hmm. safe and friendly and nice. And, and so I think for me, I just love the different ways that things can be stylized. I know that word is used a lot as a shorthand for modern styles of effects, but there's many different ways you can stylize something. It's not just the sharp shapes. And so that's my yeah. favorite. I definitely appreciate the unique designs these days where like a lot of shows they have like unique look to 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 the show like to the characters and to the back to backgrounds and uh but effects sometimes they kind of like miss this treatment for some reason like everything is super stylish but the effects are kind of generic yeah. they can be like good looking but like they, they miss the this style pass on them and i think like if the show also has the the effects that look unique to this particular show or movie or whatever i i think that's cool so there were two comments that I resonate with. First is watch Fantasia if you haven't seen it in a while. The Thunderbird Suite is just amazing. I think it's the Thunderbird Suite. Um, it's, it's the one with the the stag and then the, the volcano erupts and then the green nature spirit comes out. There's some gorgeous effects in there and I totally agree that it's impressive. And in that instance, they do a good job of blending magic with um, I guess that was Fantasia 2000. I'm sorry, that's not the original Fantasia. Uh, somebody's, someone's probably going to correct me, but, um, but yeah, that's like, I agree that it's like super impressive for me. I guess it's a personal thing. Andreas says, "Hey, I like the natural stuff. I can't. I don't really prefer the anime personally. I I think that's totally valid. You know, like different effects speak to different people." And different personalities and that's the beauty of being an effects artist is like you can find your niche and get good at the thing that you love doing or if you like trying different stuff you know one project might need this style from you and another project needs something that feels much more naturalistic and i think that's kind of the beauty of it you get to tinker you get to try stuff it's uh I always appreciate seeing different artists approach to the same problem. No two effects artists will ever solve the problem the same. And that's, I think, a very good thing. Yeah. I think that's what I also like about 2D effects. Because I feel like in 3D, there's a bit less... The chance of making something that someone else can do is a bit higher. I guess I say that, said, it, said it in a weird way. Uh, in 2D, you, you, there's a lot more room for personal expression and like personal styles. And I, I love how you can find the, the effect on the internet that you've never seen before. And quite often you can tell who made it. Like, mm -hmm. oh, that's probably like, let's say Chris Graff made it because it's like it's very distinct style mm -hmm. and it's like i don't find myself thinking that with 3d effects i can't really there's definitely like differences in the way people make 3d effects and procedural effects but i don't know like there there's less I don't. I see the person a bit less behind 3D effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, just from the time I spent uh, on League of Legends, we had a lot of different artists working on the same project. Earlier on, it was easier. Different artists had like their own unique styles. 
but as we started reusing assets from each other it became more the same <laughs> and it's like mm -hmm. that looks like an effect that so-and-so would have made and they're like yeah that's because i borrowed 75 percent of the thing from them and then i recolored yeah. it it's a few <laughs> texture changes um but i think when an artist a 3d artist makes it all from scratch they do the all the different components that go into it you can see the same thing happening for sure um but that eventually over time got washed away <laughs> on a more mature project so yeah i agree oh there's so many good comments i agree again with what andreas is saying like what you like to watch isn't always the same as what you like to make and mm -hmm. also the comment earlier that tv studios don't usually design their effects style it's kind of just up to the effects artists on the 2d shows i didn't know that i think that's really fascinating <laughs> it's like <laughs> okay so we've got these uh styles and things going on who do we have to animate effects yeah they'll do a good job i think that kind of can happen on a game too just because effects is such a difficult beast to tame and each artist has such a unique way of working anyway it's hard to wrangle that if the art director isn't super familiar with effects so i could mm -hmm. i guess understand how that might happen on tv as well that okay we have this artist i guess that's going to be the style of effects we have and uh sometimes it lines up apparently more than others i think disney tv they have some really really good cohesive effects in their styles like star versus the forces of evil um gravity falls uh what are some more recent ones that they've done too that i'm, I'm blanking on it but like i always admire when i oh um uh, tangled the tangled tv show I haven't seen it it's a really beautiful show really great style and the style of the effects matches perfectly with the style of the show and so mm -hmm. i think they're doing something right there where um Whoever, whatever the team is animating that, where they do a good cohesion with the, the effects and the, and the characters and environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if there's no model sheet, it falls apart quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't have pretty much. I have very limited experience on, like TV animation and shows. I worked on a bunch of cinematics for video games and, on the feature movie but not on the show sense mm. almost every time i was like a, the only 2d effects artist so the consistency wasn't a problem i just do my yeah my style which is not that difficult for me <laughs> uh, yeah but uh what i'm what i was saying about like unique style of every artist. Like I wasn't like, uh, I wasn't applying it to the studios or work in the studios. Like it's just, I was only saying it as an artist because like if my goal is to express myself, I have way more room in doing it with 2D animation because I'm drawing mm -hmm. the shapes that's i prefer in terms of consistency i think that's 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 not great <laughs> like because well the it's a bit more difficult to match the style like the 2d style with multiple artists than in 3d procedural effects where you can share your assets your textures and you can share way more things to make it look similar but so like i'm not saying that 2d is better for games production but just like for me personally as an artist it it gives me room to express my personality mm -hmm. yeah that's awesome i i've enjoyed this so much uh it's been so great chatting here and chatting with you guys seeing alex work it's inspiring i've got a long way to go but we'll get there. We'll get there. And yeah. I enjoyed it a lot as well. And so many people uh, are, are here. Like even now. Yeah. 
96 speaking. people in the chat. That's awesome. It's fantastic to see everyone here. It's been a pleasure. Please reach out. Uh, there's again, links in the description. If you want to stay up to date with the email list, you can join. Also, uh, if you want to just reach out to me directly, you can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, Alex as well. What's the best way to get a hold of you, Alex? Uh, YouTube and Twitter, I guess. If you're from Russia, <laughs> you can uh, find me on VK as well, but I see most of you aren't from Russia. But yeah, uh, I stream two times per week, Thursdays and Saturdays, so uh, welcome everyone. We'd we'll be happy to, to see you on my streams. I, I animate effects, kind of random effects, <laughs> similar to what I, I do today. All right. Well, it sounds good. Everyone enjoy your Saturday and uh, we'll catch you next time. Bye for now. See ya. Bye bye.